Struggling to stay up to date with social media? Do you want to get ahead online? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Public Sector Marketing Show, the podcast for public sector professionals who want to elevate their digital communications. Here's your host, Joanne Sweeney. Hello and welcome to Season 6 and Episode 101 of the Public Sector Marketing Show. In a recent episode, I spoke about the value and the power of influencer marketing in 2024. But in this episode, I'm asking some tough questions around ethics and the gray areas of this marketing discipline. Did you know there are laws in some European countries around child labor and influencer marketing? Did you know that Ireland is also currently doing research in this area? Stay tuned for more on this and other ethical considerations for brands, influencers, and of course, public sector. It's fair to say that all of us uh, in marketing need to be reminded about the core ethics. So these are the morals and the standards that we inject into our work every day. And of course, marketing is a broad discipline. It's public relations, it's traditional marketing, it's digital marketing, uh, it's broadly communications. Um, and there are four core principles. So the first one is is honesty and Honesty in the messages that you are devising, that you're publishing. Obviously, as marketers, we want to reach a specific target audience, but we must be honest with them in the messages that we are communicating. Responsibility is a big one. Now, we see a lot around social responsibility, corporate responsibility, and even sectoral responsibility. If we think about the the alcohol market, if we think about the betting market, if we think about uh, vaping or smoking, there is a responsibility for big brands to communicate messaging around health and around safety. Um, and so being responsible for the people that you are bringing into your marketing comms is something that we need to keep front of mind. Thirdly, it's about fairness, okay? So what do I mean by fairness? Well, fairness in how we tackle our marketing. We're probably aware of our competitors, but we always should act in the utmost standard around fairness. And then finally, and this one is growing as our society is evolving, And that's respect for consumers, but also society. And we'd see a lot around this area around sustainability, inclusivity, um, and and making sure that we have respect for all consumers. And it got me thinking when I was preparing for this show about how as digital marketers, we love to be very specific, granular, niche, and targeted in our marketing. And Sometimes we are omitting cohorts and omitting groups. So it's really on us as marketers to think about how we are not only writing the copy for our messages, creating those media assets, but also in the final way that we target. So whether we're doing influencer marketing, PR, traditional marketing or social media, it's a really good idea for us to be reminded of the four core ethics of marketing. Public sector pros, do you want to progress in your career? Are you going for promotion? Do you want to stay ahead of the digital media landscape? We can help you. View our training calendar at publicsectormarketingpros.com. So in today's consulting segment, I'm asking the question, what are the ethical concerns associated with influencer marketing. So we're moving from marketing more generally, stepping into influencer marketing. Some people love influencer marketing. Some people hate it. Some people have no opinion whatsoever. But whatever you think about influencer marketing, it's big business and it's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. It's forecast to be worth almost $150 billion by 2030. So you can see why lots of brands and creators are excited about this industry. We are now living, and you've heard me say this on this podcast many times, or if I've been working with you, I say it over and over again. We are living in the creator economy, stupid, where self-made TikTok, YouTube, 
Instagram and Snapchatters are bringing in six figures on a monthly basis on the back of the content that they are creating for the social networks because that's now how their business model is evolving and not strictly just around ads. We know that TikTok has a new creator program. We know that they've also launched TikTok Shop. Uh, and so the whole industry of influencer marketing is one that is very attractive to the social networks. It's a new economy. It's been driven by personalities. It's been driven by data insights. It's been driven by our attention, the attention that we give to the social networks on our smartphone. And then, of course, the social networks have the money to reinvest in those creators that are commanding our attention. So let's talk about the ethical concerns for a number of minutes. What maybe do we need to worry about? Well, authenticity is really important when aligning brands, organizations with influencers. You really want to know that the influencer is invested in the product, the service, or the cause. Do their values or their beliefs align with the messaging? And are they already sharing that with their own followers? Consistency is also important. Obviously, the influencers will have a strong presence. Um, and I'm not talking about consistency of their own visibility on the social networks. I'm talking about consistency of the conversations that they're having, the causes that they're talking about, how their lifestyle might align with a cause or a campaign that you want to launch. So it's looking at that in the, the recent past, but also maybe going a little bit further into the past to think about and to just sense check uh, whether their consistent messaging aligns with a campaign that you want to run. Disclosure is a new area in terms of influencer marketing. There are now laws and guidelines and standards and industry around it. So really disclosing when you're working with a brand or an influencer and how that relationship has come together to then tell a story to the wider audience. Um, something that I talk about is the mirror effect. You would have heard me mention before creating just like me stories where the content creator is creating content that's really resonating with that mass audience that you're speaking to. And, and this is where influencer marketing can be really powerful for public sector because government and public sector organizations can be by and large faceless apart from having you know, politicians or maybe a senior advisor within a department that, that may do front of house media or social media stuff, but it's, it's fairly rare. So with that faceless organization, it's really hard for audiences to connect, to resonate, and to get that emotional and, and those feels that a creator can bring to the table. So when you work with a creator, that has had a lived experience or is using a public service and wants to tell their story and they become, I guess, that leading light that other people can resonate with, then you're on to a winner. And so when thinking about influencer marketing, thinking about ethics, there's so much to consider because it's very nuanced and no matter how plan much you plan or how much you prepare, there may be a few sticky wickets along the way where really observant members of the public might call you out. Um, but apart from that, um, it is a growing area of marketing discipline. Uh, and when we get, get to the interview stage of this episode, I think it's going to blow your mind. This is a fascinating interview, probably one of the most fascinating interviews that I've had in a hundred episodes of the Public Sector Marketing Show. So Dr. Frances Reese took some time out recently to tell me about her research, which considers the impact of digital child labor on child performers who are deemed under the age of 13 as regards social media like TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. Effectively, her research says that Children do not appear in their own right as they are underage, but the parent or guardian acts as a conduit, managing the account and curating the content. Uh, Dr. Reese is a lecturer at Essex Law School 
and she's been working on appearance discrimination in the workplace with a specific view to forms of aesthetic labour where an attractive appearance is integral to the employability of the workforce. Um, take some time out and don't double job when you're listening to this interview because it's, it's quite amazing and I can tell you one thing, I learned a lot. So I really hope um, that you get a lot out of it. Dr. Reese, thank you so much for joining me on the Public Sector Marketing Show. Thanks for having me, Joanne. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, as we're having this conversation currently, you're currently in Carlo with SETU. We'll get to that. But first of all, introduce yourself um, and your work to our viewers and to our listeners. Uh, so my name is Frances Rees. I'm a lecturer in law at the University of Essex in the UK. Uh, I'm from Ireland originally, but that hasn't influenced my choice in terms of looking for a location outside the UK to also trial the project. Uh, so the project is looking at child influencer labour. We've taken a perspective of looking so far at the legislation. So obviously having a lawyer's background, I've been looking at the law in relation to this. So we've had law in France, soon to be Belgium, and also in Illinois uh, relating to child influencer labour. Uh, so in looking at the legislation, the regulation around this, what we've seen is still in relation to regulating this area, a lot of pressure is still being placed upon parents. Because if you're thinking about child influencer labour taking place usually within the home, so parents are filming children under 13. So I'm not looking at kids who are older than 13 because then they may be allowed to have their own accounts. But children under 13, where usually a parent or guardian is acting as conduit for them uh, and hosting the account in some way. So where parents are, uh, you know, encouraging their children in, in terms of their own influence or practice, we see that the home can effectively turn into some sort of workspace for kids in this way where there's, you know, filming, propping, editing, scripting, et cetera, and branding going on. So I've looked at this in terms of legislation in places, but as I say, even in France, in talking to Bruno Sude, who introduced the legislation there, he recognised that what they were effectively trying to do is educate parents about practice in this area. And still there's a responsibility on the parents to self-report and self-regulate effectively, because they're the ones who are stating what hours the child might be working, uh, putting the money on, under a trust, etc., and declaring it as an income. So... We're looking at areas both where there's regulation and where there's none. Um, so that's one of the reasons I've cho chosen the UK and Ireland uh, as areas where there is no legislation. Um, and thinking about where there may be legislation or where there's none, still that uh, informing parents, um, you know, the way they say there is no handbook for rearing children. Well, that, you, you and I know that's not true. Like you go to the library and there's loads of books from the child being inside to the child going off to uni. There's loads of them. But there is actually no book to help parents uh, and support them in this area. So they've effectively been doing this on their own bat without support and without understanding um, effectively what sort of a space they're putting their child out into. Um, so this work aims to start that dialogue more clearly with parents in helping them understand their own practices in this area. It really is a sign of the times that we're having this conversation about child influencing labour. And, you know, before we're having this conversation, like I, I'm looking at myself, I've got I've got two children, I've got a granddaughter and you know, you said uh, in France, uh, the experience there with the legislation is the objective is to is to educate parents and not penalize them. Mm -hmm. Let's develop that a little bit more because some people will, you know, maybe discovering you for the first time and your work and the legislation in the other um, states and countries. Um, where do you think we need to go um, apart from education? You know, should should parents be doing it, you know, and le leveraging their children for financial gain and social media profile and prominence? I mean, there's not only, I guess, legislative considerations, but but moral also. Right. And then financial, of course, if you're making money. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And I think what we're trying to do with this, it's a very emotive topic. Uh, every parent has their own view on every aspect of parenting. Every parent has their own view of what other people's parenting should or could look like. Um, and that's one of the risks we're even identifying in the project of recognising the opportunity for family discord in this area where grandparents might disagree with how parents are behaving in this area, where parents are no longer together or estranged, where parent practice in this area is in disagreement. So uh, as well as the like external view of whether people should be doing this at all or how they're doing it. Uh, there, there's also internal struggles or where one child may be um, performing to a higher extreme or more of a revenue uh, generation than other siblings. Um, so it's it, there is external discord, there's internal discord, there's financial, commercial, monetary, regulatory. There's so many layers to this, to be honest. Um, as I say, from, from my point of view, also a parent uh, of, of a young woman who's been out in the world uh, for quite a while now, uh, and I've been aware of the digital footprint there. So everybody's got an opinion on this. Um, and I guess I'm not the gatekeeper on this practice. I'm not the uh, finger pointer as to whether it should or shouldn't go on. That's for people bigger and braver than me to take on, to be honest. I'm just very aware that it happens. And I'm very aware that uh, parents have had to do this or have ch chosen to do this or have done this without any guidance and I now want to have a conversation with those people and ask them really you know as experts of your own kids anyway um, how's it been for you like uh, would you recognize the thing the things that I have identified as risks are real or truthful so there's that opportunity within the survey I'll be launching tomorrow. You know, do you think that this is even harmful? Would you recognise this as an issue facing your child in this area? And then if you have, or if you do, have you encountered it while you've been, you know, endorsing these practices or behaving in this way? And how have you have you dealt with it? So if we're taking a risk assessment pro approach to the work without engaging in you know i'm a lawyer i'm i'm not here to to discuss the semantics of whether they should or shouldn't be or to stop them um they're out there doing it they're doing it unsupported they're doing it unguided um the regulation will come to tell them how or when to behave in certain ways there's loads of advertising regulation in every other media there's lots of child employment reg legislation in every other area there isn't anything like that here yet, and it will come. But in the meantime, we have to be talking to these people about, you know, I, I kind of see this like as a Drew Barrymore moment or or the, the kid in Charlie Chaplin uh, who led to the Cooney legislation in the US. Like someday down the line, there will be a young person who has no money or who has uh, is experiencing difficulties from the harms they faced through some of these practices. And, and the person that they'll be able to go to or to point the finger at uh, will be the parent who has uh, endorsed and conducted the account. So um, I, I want to try and have that conversation now so that we're all aware of, of the harms and trying to minimise the risks really of harm to the child and their future selves. Yeah, and we, we know in the digital age, I mean, it, it totally is a, a revolution and the greatest revolution of all time. And, and now mm -hmm. we have... AI, which can usurp any sort of reality yeah. online. And we know the legislation comes later than than reality. So your yeah. the timing of your research is important. Talk to us about the, the collaboration with SETU and how they are involved. And then what will how will the research be used in, in, in practice or to inform governments and policymakers? Yes, yeah, so I've uh, been in touch with Dr. O'Leary here. So Do Dr. Alan O'Leary is introducing the content creation uh, program in September here at Carlo. And um, I'm just impressed by the networks and connections to industry practitioners and to people who are um, out there, you know, in the industry. And that's that's really the attractive nature of this collaboration is that we're working together to have these conversations because you know I've done a lot of desk research I've talked to a lot of academics I've talked to politicians and now it's about talking to real people who are out there in the industry as I say I'm recognizing that this goes on um, and I'm recognizing that 
I feel there are harms that children could be exposed to in this arena. So I felt that C2 uh, were a great institution in terms of their connections with, you know, digital marketing, social media, industry practitioners. Um, and Dr. O'Leary has been fantastic in rallying the troops to, to, you know, get behind this launch and to get it out into the world. So we'll be launching the survey tomorrow. And um, that's that's the aim really is to, is to start conversation. Uh, I've been behind a desk long enough. So now it's time to, to start conversation with people who are actually working in this area and, you know, not uh, fear mongering, but actually seeing, oh, do you even recognize this as a thing or is this something that we would just be fret fretting about um, I, I'm minded of my colleague in LSE in the UK, uh, Professor Sonia Livingston, who talks about us approaching this as the same sort of way that you'd approach, you had to approach road safety back in the day, you know, a combination of uh, parents, uh, planners, people who made cars, people who made roads, you know, all, all sorts of people coming together to, to think about how to safely manage the fact that you know, driving is not great for anybody and you're, you're behind it, the wheel of a death machine and, uh, you know, roads are dangerous places to be on, but we're all going to do it. So how does what does safe practice look like? Um, and in any workplace, you do a risk assessment. And if we're talking about this, this home now becoming a workplace, which it has been for loads of us, especially after COVID, you know, there's loads of people in this platform economy who are behaving in this way. Yeah. The difference here is like now children are working below effectively parents who have introduced them into this arena. Yeah, and we know that the EU have tightened up trafficking laws, laws and that includes, you know, the trafficking of children. We know in mm -hmm. Ireland they've spearheaded, um, you know, Coco's Law, online abuse as a crime. Um, and yeah. some MEPs are trying to get that um, as a Europe-wide piece of legislation. So the fact that Belgium and France already have looked at this and there's precedent there from a European context, makes me feel that um, Ireland's eyes will be very interested in your work, I, I presume. I hope so. And that's the plan. You know, the, when I applied for the funding for this project, the funding application did say regulation and or education. And, and I think they go hand in hand. But in, in an area, as I say, so poorly regulated, I think that that is, is an important step. But as I say, even in areas where I've seen regulation being introduced, the pressure still is on parents a lot to to know that they have to do this. And, and even that, that they think about what they're doing as work, at the, even that they think about it as some sort of labor, which is already a stretch, you know, to get people to think about, oh, you know, they just look lovely and cute into thinking about it as actual work. So, yeah, the research I've done to date identifies sort of four categories where these behaviours are manifested. So four types of influencer activity that we see uh, for children under 13. Um, and then it, it kind of talks as well about when that goes from, you know, sharing or, oh, they look cute in their communion dress to uh, thinking about it becoming labour in some way because there's some sort of not just economic enterprise but thinking about the, the as I say the stuff like propping and scripting and editing and uh, branding and, and all of that stuff that goes on behind the scenes that's different to oh they're playing with their puppy I'm just going to take a picture or, or snap a video of it. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, the, the finger pointing and the the judgmental approach. And I think it's really important, and you've already said it, that this is a collaborative and an open conversation for yeah. new times that we live in, um, finding ourselves as parents in a place that, you know, is, is new and the guidebook is not being written, but it is being written with, you know, experts like you. So, that's what we don't want to happen is it is, is divisiveness and blame mm. and it, it needs to be a, a real level-headed conversation doesn't it i think so and I, I mean i was quite shocked in the uk to see in looking at the uk slip committee into influencer culture um they they managed to call upon some very interesting ex experts in this field in this area but they really struggled to um, have parents or to have young influencers represented. And I think there is that fear of four parents in putting their head above the parapet to expose themselves to that sort of judgment. Um, so, you know, this, the survey that I'm launching is anonymous in nature in that I, I don't have any way to uh, identify or articulate 
who has, uh, you know, been participating in it and who has, um, you know, interacted with it, even if they don't find anything that I've said to be a risk. I won't know who they are or if they, uh, in the free text comments, want to tell me they vehemently disagree with me. I won't have any way to identify them. I think that that's important at this stage is to um, give people that freedom to say whatever it is they, they feel they need to, to help me with my understanding of this as an academic on the outside. Um, and if they won't engage with policymakers as they haven't in the UK directly, this will hopefully give uh, a safer space for them to be able to communicate so that I can share externally afterwards. Um, I'm hoping to also have face-to-face -face conversations and involve people. Um, I've been in touch with the ISBCC and Cyber Safe Kids here so um you know I'm, I'm hoping those conversations can be had it is as i say very difficult to open people up to areas where they might feel that there's, there's going to be that judgment um and, and just finally you know you you're spearheading this research in an irish context um but are there any experiences from from the Belgian uh, or French or Illinois that that you can kind of shed some light on where it's made a, a positive change or it's clarified things for parents? Um, I, th I think the difficulty, as I said, with so Belgium and Illinois, uh, Belgium just about to introduce Illinois, just have introduced France introduced in 2019 and then updated it last year to be broader stroke, uh, to go beyond influencer culture and to also to, to cover sharing. Um, so in terms of, as I say, the French legislation is most helpful in terms of how long it's been in, in place. And as I say, even talking to, to Bruno Sude, the, the uh, politician who introduced both, both bills, which became acts and our law, um, they're looking at a couple of thing, key areas. So they're looking at the financial provision. Um, so making sure that uh, like if a child model or a child actor uh, had earnings, those would be placed under a trust for them, whereas child influencer labour doesn't have those same sort of protections. So there's protections for the finances. Um, there's also the right to erasure. But again, the trouble with that is like a child would have to know that they ha that the content is there, that they have a problem with the content, and then ask a parent for it to be removed. So as I say, a lot of these rights, it's great that we're having the conversation about and that they're being regulated for. The, the trouble is the enforcement side. You know, a child knowing that they have the right to erasure is a very different thing to a child having the right to erasure. Um, so there, there are those. And the other one uh, that's critical and, and brings them on par with actors and models would be the education. So um, acknowledging that there is uh, a labour activity going on, engaging with a local education authority and explaining that to them, which again falls to the parent to love the working hours and understand the impact on their schooling and on their um, educational attainments and attendance. So... It, in a way, it's like if you were thinking about parents it, in a way where they this regulation is there to, to protect the child from a parent exploiting or extorting them, it's still leaving a lot of power in the parents' hands in terms of, of them self-reporting the hours of work, um, of, of acknowledging that this is money that's come to them and that, that has to be put under trust, etc. And again, listening to a child to the extent that they will remove the content if the child has a problem with it. So those are some of the lessons to be learned in terms of, of a regulatory approach. Um, as I say, in terms of, of how effective they are, it's hard to say because very little um, punishment has occurred. But it's one of the key areas I looked at with my French research team was, OK, so we have, it's great we have legislation, but has anybody actually been punished? And there are situations where brand... Uh, brand relationships aren't disclosed and the money trail is hard to find um, and although there is a, a an area uh, of the French civil service dedicated to this enforcement uh, to date none of it's been used so uh, it, in terms of, of effective nature I still think that conversation with parents is critical. Francis is absolutely fascinating um, and 
wishing you really well with with the research and uh, findings and what follows on um and maybe we'll speak again as a follow-up and um, it's great to have this irish collaboration but uh, thank you so much for your time and wishing you all the best thanks ever so much john thank you So before I wrap up episode 101, I want to remind you that our three signature accredited courses have been updated and are now available to take from our brand new website. So go and take a look at publicsectormarketingpros.com. I do have a wait list. People have been getting in touch, wondering when I'm running the courses again live, but they are available on demand. And of course, if you want to take any of those courses internally for more broadly your staff within the organization, I can do that on a one-to-one -one basis. If you haven't already, please, please recommend the Public Sector Marketing Show to a pro that you know. I guess cumulatively over YouTube and across all the podcast channels, we're near hitting over 15,000 uh, views and downloads at the moment. It's a niche audience, uh, but it's a very powerful audience. And I always appreciate you guys showing up, whether it's to watch, to listen, or indeed to share. So I'll see you on the next show. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with a public sector pro you know. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. For more free resources, details of our upcoming training courses and consulting options, log on to publicsectormarketingpros.com.